Well, this is our uh, third installment. We're here tonight uh, to interview two more uh, candidates for trustees for the village of Deerfield. And with us tonight is Mary Oppenheim. She's our current trustee here in the village. This is uh, just finishing up what your first, first term. term. And uh, we're glad you're here with us tonight. And before we start, we're going to go around and introduce ourselves. Thank you. Don't be nervous. Okay. We're all okay. friends. Cheery lady. Hi. Uh, David Krupa. Hi. Uh, Steve Slater. Nice to meet you. Michael Shalin. Hi. Jack Sears. Dan Shapiro. Harry Gold. Mike DeBall. Nice to meet all of you. Am I okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, it's nice to meet you, and um, I appreciate your time. Thank you for taking the time and allowing me to come and talk with you tonight. Um, it really, I really have been honored to serve as a village trustee for the last three and a half years. And during that time, I've really been fortunate, too, to work with a really exceptional group of people. Um, other residents, the staff, and um, other officials. And I've learned a tremendous amount both about the nuts and bolts of how the um, municipality is run and how it's governed, and also about, I think, the heart and the spirit of this community and the people in it. Um, I think that we have made some very good decisions over this past term, and I feel that we are moving Deerfield forward in a very positive direction. I'm excited about where we're at and where we're headed, and um, I think that Deerfield, despite all of our challenges that we have, is fiscally healthy. I think we're socially enlightened, and I think that uh, it's a very caring and welcome community to come into. This is a great place to live, whether you're part of a young family, whether you're middle-aged, whether you're a senior citizen. Even the teenagers like it here. They may tell you different, but they do like it here. So I'm very grateful to call it home. So it sounds like a cliche, but I really am um, feeling that it's been both a privilege and a pleasure to serve on the board. And I really would like the opportunity to continue to serve and use my time and my energy to help build our future. So once again, I thank you for your time, and I'm delighted to answer any questions you have for me. Great. Um, so that's it. Jerry, you want to start tonight? Sure. I'd be, I'd be glad to. Thank you for your, for your service. You mentioned some challenges. Could you elaborate on what those are and what you might be facing? <clears throat> well, it's funny. When I looked at the uh, questionnaire that I filled out four years ago before I ran for my first term, um, the challenges are, are largely the same. They haven't changed much over the last four years, I believe. Um, Number one is how to do more with less, how to continue to deliver all the services that we deliver to people, have great police service, have our infrastructure you know, work, have the roads not falling. We've got an aging infrastructure. We have um, some facilities that haven't been dealt with for a number of years, and we have less revenue to do it with. So you have to be creative. Um, you're challenged all the time to try to figure out how to do these things. And that's, I guess that's our number one problem. You know, we did have a chance to speak <coughs> with Kent Street and his staff, and mm -hmm. they didn't mention the infrastructure. So do you feel that the village is situated well enough fiscally to handle these challenges going forward? I do. Um, and I've been really gratified by the thoroughness of the information that the staff has shared with us and um, has laid out as part of a long-range plan. You know, the, the infrastructure um, major projects are laid out, you know, for years in the future. And there's a rotation as to when we get to certain streets and what condition they're in, and that's adjusted as they find things are better or worse. And when big things come up, how they fit it in. I, I do, <clears throat> because we've seen that long range um, projection, I do think <coughs> that um, we're going to be okay. So there's been some talk uh, consistently during these interviews about uh, vacancies for yeah. the and for the sales tax, lack, lack of sales tax for Deerfield. Um, <coughs> there's also been some talk about possibly exploring hiring someone independent whose sole purpose is to try to get businesses in here, um, things of that nature. That hasn't been done at this point. What is your position on that? You know, we've actually discussed it. Um, 
at the board level, um, at a committee of the whole, and um, I really don't see how it's a good decision for us fiscally to have somebody mm -hmm. on board that we're paying just to do that kind of function. And it would have to be somebody like that that, that is their only function because they'd have to be an expert at it. Um, I don't feel like the size of the community that we are and um, the amount of administration that we have that it's really warranted. Um, I think that the commercial landlords in this community are pretty motivated to try to fill their spots and they're way more expert about this stuff than most people and it would be difficult to bring somebody in even if we wanted to expend those resources who would be better at it than the people that are already looking. Um, I just don't see that it would be a real benefit at this point. Has it been discussed at how much you guys expect to have to pay someone to do that? Salary wise? Specifically? Yeah, 100,000, 50,000, things like that. Um, I think we all have an assumption in our head that it would be, you know, a substantial full time salary somewhere in between those two numbers. Between 15 and 100,000. I would think so, but we really haven't discussed it. Okay. That would just be, you know, my guesstimate as to what the, the cost would and be. And you don't think the benefit of having someone do that based on the amount of um, sales tax revenue that could be obtained? if that person was successful. But once again, if they revenue. weren't successful, we would have expended that amount of money and it wouldn't have gained us. So um, I think it's a chance that you would take. I don't think our situation calls for it at this point. I think there's other things that we can do and that we are doing to try to address the concerns. I just don't think we're a large enough community and, and our, our uh, vacancies are that great that it really would be a winning situation for us. Okay, just one last follow-up question. Sure. Um, have you uh, have you looked into whether neighboring communities of similar size to Deerfield do have an independent person doing that? Has that been explored? Um, I, the staff may have looked at that, and there may have been mention of it. I don't really recall. I think Highland Park maybe have somebody, but other than that. Um, I don't think that the communities around us really have done that, but I'm not sure. I really don't know. Sorry. Um, thanks. Uh, you mentioned in your in your write-up that you would streamline that process, or you would like to streamline the process of attracting new businesses to Deerfield. Um, could you elaborate a little bit on well, what you meant by that? Well, you know, I'm first. I really do want to restate that I really am a firm believer in the zoning and the permitting process that we have in place. I mean, it's there for a reason, and I think by and large it really does work. I mean, it's the opportunity for people to, you know, speak out in public if a business is coming and it's going to impact them. It really, you have to go through that process, I think, really, to do your due diligence to make sure that you're serving everybody well. That being said, um, I think that we have to make every effort to make it go through as quickly as possible, that there aren't unnecessary delays in terms of I can't convene a meeting for two weeks and you got to wait another three weeks, that kind of thing. Um, I think that we could look at maybe there may be ways, depending on the size of the um, venture, you know, maybe the process could be a little bit different. I think our staff has to bend over backwards to give as much information as they can when people come in, whether it's a, a retail or a business entity or, or somebody who just wants to come in and find out about patching the roof on their garage. I think they need to really be of service to the people who come in and steer them in the right direction so they don't encounter some kind of long detour that sets them off, you know, and waste time. I think, um, I don't think there's um, an expenditure of money, you know, for this process for, for most people that's a problem. But um, I would want to make sure there's, there's a little bit of overlap with our commission structure where we've got, you know, the plan commission and then we've got the ARC and we've got the VCDC. It may be something that we want to revisit to look to see if maybe there's some way to streamline that process that they don't have to, you know, wait in between, you know, getting permission from all three of these entities or maybe the VCDC doesn't need to weigh in on, you know, a lot of this other stuff. So, um, pardon me? Have you looked at that? <laughs> Have we? Not really. No. But I, I certainly think it would be a, a fruitful thing to do. 
So. <clears throat> um, one of the first things you said is that you're happy with the direction of where we're going. I think. Um, where are we going? I, I don't. I don't <laughs> mean that, you know, in a smart tone. It's just that living here in Deerfield, I see that we kind of expanded as much as we're going to do. Yep. There's nothing. Ma there's no major changes I see coming on the horizon. Maybe there are, and maybe you know something that I don't. I hope you do. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just wondering if you could say, yeah. where are we going? What are we going to do other than just maintain what we have? We're going to, like, like for example, you mentioned the roads. We're going to continue to replace mm -hmm. roads as they wear out, mm -hmm. and we replace the water treatment. It reached the end of its life, and it right. wore out, and we right. replace it. Is there anything else going on other than just mm -hmm. maintaining what we have? Yeah, I, I think that um, one of the things that we really try to do is when we do maintain, when we do take care of stuff, we try to upgrade it as much as we can within the resources we have. And one of the things that's very near and dear to my heart, particularly since I'm a landscape designer, I'm a horticulturist by trade, um, is that all of these things that we're doing, we're doing with an eye to sustainability. And I know the village talked for a lot of years, sort of lip service. We talked the talk and we didn't really walk the walk. But um, the, I think <laughs> I see us going in a direction where we really are starting to do that more now. Um, when we talk about fixing the roads and fixing the, the sewers and all that kind of stuff, we're doing a study trying to figure out why there's so much inflow and infiltration into our storm sewers that uh, from our you know, rainwater and it goes into the treatment plant and you know, causes up to us to use more energy to re we um, treat it and the two things should be separate. Looking at that, improving that whole system is a direction that I think is not just maintaining. You know, it's an upgrade. Um, we're looking at facilities to make sure that, um, you know, they're energy efficient. We're looking at sharing things with the park district and sharing things with, you know, other entities to make them a little bit more uh, cost effective, a little bit more win-win um, for the, the taxpayers because we have, you know, largely the same tax base. So I, I see that there is a direction, there's progress in terms of attitude and the way we're dealing with some of these, these uh, things. Um, I see that... Um, it's very interesting. Last week I went to an open house for um, a home that was um, retrofitted and fixed up as an affordable home for a young family. One Deerfield place um, got a grant and they are um, trying to do this in a wider scale in the village and certainly we support that and I would love to see the village get more involved in that um, preserving some of our housing stock that we have and make it livable for people rather than you know only going the teardown route um, you know we're refining some of the codes to make things um, a little bit looking at the future rather than you know maintaining you know we've we've rewritten the codes for solar and for um, wind energy, so I see it as a, as a positive direction and one that we really have to go in. I mean, it is the challenge of the future for all of us. And um, so I'm hoping it's not just status quo. I'm seeing some new stuff. Trustee um, Oppenheim, um, you mentioned wind and solar. Is that a priority for the village? I think Saving energy, saving the cost of energy, is a priority for the village. Making it possible for our residents to have those kinds of alternative energy in such a way that it is um, compatible with their neighbors is a priority for the village. Um, I feel very strongly that we need to, once again, the way we should streamline processes to make it easier mm -hmm. for businesses to do these things. It's our function to lead the way to make it easier if people want to do this. 
So does the village find it a priority? I mean, you know, we investigated using some kind of solar or even geothermal heating when um, we designed the wastewater reclamation plant in the administrative building. We're going for LEED certification, but we looked at it, but we got to be practical too. If you don't save money and if it doesn't work, if it's not practical, then you don't do it. So, you know, we're investigating that stuff. Do we see it as a priority? Mm, I do. Um, and I think many of, many of uh, the staff do. So I think we see as a priority being as sustainable as possible. A follow-up question. Uh -huh. um, your packet, you mentioned um, uh, fossil fuel alternatives mm -hmm. in, in, under the, the, in the bucket of energy savings and within the village. Of, would you categorize natural gas as a fossil fuel in the in the in the bigger picture of climate? Well, because energy? it's not renewable, certainly. Well, but it's the most abundant energy source that we have in this country. Currently, it is, and certainly, I you know, there's nothing we're going to do here that's going to change that. And certainly, we use gas throughout the the village. So, would you advocate? more or less of that with, in terms of just utilization within the village itself for its vehicles and whatever, would you be a, an advocate of less of that or more of that? Well, I think it would depend on, <laughs> um, number one, the cost, number two, um, the pollution. I always ask, and they're kind of tired of it, I guess, but they expect this question from me. Every time we purchase a vehicle, whether or not it can be a hybrid vehicle, whether we could get an electric vehicle, if there were a um, fiscally advantageous way for us to utilize an energy source that is less polluting and doesn't increase our carbon footprint, I'm certain we'd be all for it. One of the things that is really discussed now and is focused on, I think, particularly by public works and by the whole staff, really, they look at those things. And I think that's kind of a new direction that we're, we're going in. So, you know, um, we've made a lot of changes with the, the garbage pickup service. I mean, this is the down and dirty stuff of village governance. It's not so glamorous, you know? We've got garbage trucks. We had to fix the sewage treatment plant. But um, the kinds of trucks that we use from waste management, some of these are hybrid vehicles. There's less pollution there. I mean, we're looking at all that stuff. So, um, you know, I certainly am open-minded to to all of it. But I like your, your, your um, you mentioned business case a lot. I like that, the pragmatic implementations of these technologies. And I think it's important, I'm a big fan of long range planning if we can do it. And I think it's important that we set the structure, that we set the framework that allows us to take these steps to even try them you know, in a timely way that we don't have to wait two years to change the code till we can try it and then the technology's obsolete and we've missed our chance, you know. I, I like looking ahead and, and being prepared to do that. Thank you. Since you mentioned the uh, garbage trucks, can yeah. I break in with a question here? Sure. Um, uh, material that I've read from the village and you mentioned it and uh, one of the other candidates mentioned it, talked about the, uh, the, the clean, um, garbage trucks, you know, they use natural gas and mm -hmm. they lower emitting. However, the uh, our previous contractor had trucks that had dual compartments. So we would just have one truck visit our house. Mm -hmm. It seems now that these trucks are they're driving twice as far. Was there any consideration <coughs> of that when when you yeah. looked in uh, Yeah, instance? and you know they've they've they showed it all to us on paper. Okay. And we're um, pretty confident that they're living up to it, that there are fewer trucks in the village because it's only two days a week as opposed to, you know, they were here four days a week before, mm -hmm. um, that there is actually less, fewer miles, you know, on the road <clears throat> than there were before. So um, efficiency-wise, they really have and they've shown us numbers. I mean, they, the staff goes over that as to what they've done. I know 
I feel your pain. I know. I see the same thing. I hear them in the morning, although my grandkids come over and they love it when the, you know, the robot <laughs> arms come up and they pick up the bin, you know, so there's a little excitement too. But um, even though they do have to do that, because it's fewer days, it comes out to less. That's what we've been told. Yeah, I got it. Uh, earlier you were talking about affordable housing. Yes. Which I think some years ago had a little more traction yes. or a little more interest than it is these days. Yes. Um, and, and that kind of is the jumping off point for my question. What are your thoughts about making this community um, more diverse, you know, economically, sociologically, uh, racially, whatever? Um, because we're doing really well here. This is a pretty affluent, white, upper middle class neighborhood. So um, what are your thoughts about how we can expand our base, if, if at all, if that's what you're thinking? Well, I think that the stronger, your community is stronger with more diversity. I certainly think that, um, you know, somebody asked me last time about what, what kind of a, a village board I thought we should have, who should be on it, and I said the best boards are the ones with the most diversity, the most different kinds of people. The best, to me, communities are the ones with the most different kinds of people as well because they all give a different point of view and they have something different to contribute. Um, as far as promoting diversity in our community, um, the reality is we are of a certain socioeconomic level here and the housing cost is of a certain level. One of the reasons why I am very eager to see more affordable housing in this community is that I do believe it is the single largest contributor to diversity of your population. You know, your housing stock, if you can get younger people, you can get, you know, more urban people, you can get, you know, a single older people who can stay in their homes if you have a little bit more affordable housing. So it's so difficult here. Wow. And this is a terrible, this is a one we've gone round and round with. Um, we're pretty much be built out in this community. Most of the housing is developed. Um, ironically, um, the housing that, you know, some have advocated in the comprehensive plan, there's a couple of places where they advocate tearing down the housing and putting up affordable housing and of course the housing that they're tearing down is part of the affordable housing stock that we currently have. So, you know, the irony is is deafening. Um, I think that, like I saw last week, taking an older home that's in bad shape, fixing it up, and renting it out at a rate that a young family perhaps somebody with some difficulty in, with employment can live in, um, renting it out to someone who can work in the community as a police officer or whatever, um, would be the way to go. It's just a question of how do we organize that? How do we organize that? We don't have um, a group here in Deerfield. There are groups, you know, in the surrounding communities that have been very successful with it. We've worked with them. Um, Kathy. Uh, Levesque and the uh, one of our planners is on various committees, you know, where they've met and, and, and tried to work out rules to do this. There just doesn't seem to have been at this point an opportune time to jump in because there really is the reality you need some startup capital. Somebody needs to buy the house and own the house and fix it up in order for um, someone who needs the affordable housing to be able to get it. This particular instance that we saw, because one Deerfield place had this wonderful, I don't even know where they got it, but they, they did have this uh, resource. They had some, the ability to buy this home. Um, if we could do that, some communities have built-in incentives for developers in developing single-family homes to do this and in rehabbing homes. I certainly would be open to that, but thus far, I am told that we really haven't had any in interest from developers in even doing it here. So as far as promoting other diversity, um, I'm stumped, but I'm, I'm with you.
Well, first of all, I wanted to <coughs> applaud your efforts in answering all our questions. This is one of the most uh, comprehensive documents I, I ever read uh, while I was on the caucus committee, so you really put some time and effort into it. Thanks. Uh, my question involves uh, something you said on page five, that you feel that Deerfield has a problem in our community regarding trust for local government. Mm -hmm. and I was wondering if you could uh, ex uh, expand on that uh, statement. Well, um, I'm not sure if this is just recently. I do believe that it's increased over the last few years, and it's unfortunate because in this community, the government is all volunteers. These are not, you know, uh, career politicians who are getting any kind of personal benefit from trying to be on a board or be on a commission or anything else. So it is truly unfortunate that way. Um, I have over the last couple of years, um, particularly as we went through the controversies with the school district, it's a really good case in point with District 109 um, trying to resolve their um, uh, teacher contract. It got to be so controversial and so difficult and so many people had so many opinions. We live in the internet age and um, it's a good thing to be able to get information out quickly but it's maybe less of a good thing that bad information can get out just as quickly and rumors can spread and um, people can pass along opinions that perhaps are not fair. Um, I do find when I talk to people one-on-one, -on -one, you know, when I go and I sit in the, the farmer's market, people will come to us and say, um, you know, I heard this and this, that you're doing this. And of course, it's, so many of these things are not true. A lot of it comes from ignorance. So um, I think it, it's just part and parcel of a whole national malaise that we have. Um, and, it's, and it's passed on down and it's unfortunate. It really is unfortunate. And I think this is a community with a whole lot of volunteers in it. A whole lot of people who are motivated to work in the schools and work for the library and work for the village and do all these things. And it dissuades them when their neighbors sort of don't trust what they're doing. And I think the only way really to fight it is be as open as possible, get as much information out there as possible, bring people into the process as much as possible. Um, you know, the fact that the Village Board televises their meetings, I think helps with some of the things that we do. Um, sometimes I talk to the people who say they're suspicious that we do business not in the public meeting, which we do not because it's illegal. I mean, there are laws that govern that. Um, you know, some of the bodies who do not pub, uh, televise their meetings have more difficulty, you know, because they don't have that public record of what they've, they've actually done. But um, I do find it unfortunate, you know, when I, when I talk to people and there is this distrust that um, there are hidden taxes somewhere that aren't being used or, you know, we, we haven't done our due diligence and gotten the best price, you know, for building something or, you know, when it's pretty much all out there in the open. I think sometimes people are frustrated and maybe they just don't want to believe what you tell them. But all you can do is continue to tell them as much as you can and hope you win a couple of them over. And, um, I find it disheartening. I'm not sure if it's getting better or worse, but all you can do is be as open as you can be. Thanks. You mentioned in your responses that um, uh, I have and will continue to promote that we set standards for energy efficiency and sustainability yep. that must be met for approval of any development. Is that uh, um, a development done by the village or private development? Um, that's a real good question. And um, yes and yes. Mm -hmm. Any development that we do, that the village does, um, we do, the board does regularly say, have we done this? Have you done this kind of lighting? Do we have, you know, when they um, redevelop Carlisle Avenue, we wanted to make sure that the lights that we used were, you know, the most energy efficient and we're trying to replace things throughout the village, you know, so they're more sustainable. That is something that's in-house and it's policy and we do it. As far as outside development, we really do not have written into our codes um, that it is a requirement 
to do those kinds of things. However, I do know that in the plan commission where I served, you know, prior to being on the board, it's always a question that gets asked. What are you doing? Are you going to use this kind of material? Or um, how energy efficient is this? Um, at this point, I don't think that a lot of this stuff is written into code. I would certainly support that. And I have urged my colleagues and brought it up with staff that I think that we do need to review some of our ordinances to try and um, promote that building is done in a sustainable way. At um, a certain point, though, if you push all those things in right away, if you don't sort of phase them in, you do run the, the risk of making it harder for development, which is what we talked about to begin with. You know, how do you make it easier? So, you know, you're always trying to go for this balance. I was going to ask if that's something to do on a, on a local level when it's, you know, maybe going in advance of what neighboring towns are doing. Especially well, because this isn't just a local issue. Absolutely. I mean, it's, uh, you know, global resources. Absolutely. Is that better served by being regulated at a state level or something like that? Could be, but you know what? It's sort of like our um, ordinance that we introduced to prohibit um, using your cell phone unless it's handheld while you're driving. One of the arguments that we heard from people was this is better if it's at the state level and it's um, uniform for everybody. It should come down from the state rather than top down rather than bottom up. Well, we found that when you're proactive and you do something like that, other places do it too, and that's what influences things that happen at the state level. I think you do both. And I think that in the building industry, there's more and more of a push for sustainability and using materials that are non-polluting. And, you know, there's federal law about that as well. Um, and then when you model that kind of behavior, like uh, when we did the wastewater treatment plant, we um, kept all the spoil on site and ground it up and used it for other things and so we didn't have to bring it out and you know use utilize that energy of the trucks trekking it out and taking it other places um, when you do that and you have a contractor you insist on it the contractor does it he can learn from that and on the next job that worked really well I'm going to do it on the next one I mean part of it is just education and you're teaching people so I think you make all those efforts I um, certainly wouldn't want to do anything that really made it very difficult for people all of a sudden, you know, to, to build what they want to build. But I would be in favor of everything that we can do to make requirements for certain um, environmental or sustainability levels in what we build. Well, we have a little bit more time, so we're going to go around again and see sure. if there are questions. Sure. Jerry, okay. I do, yeah. Thank you very much. So you mentioned that you lobby for our interest with local legislators yeah. and in Springfield, which is ad. What are you lobbying for? Um, we belong to, um, oh, as it happens, we belong to the Northwest Municipal Conference, which is a group of, um, you know, all of the communities in the area getting together and they actually have a platform of things that you know is our official platform that we're all trying to push for which makes it more powerful if everybody's agreeing and doing the thing um, we're we've um, the mayor and I went to Springfield and lobbied and, and I go to a number of legislative you know meetings locally and try to talk to people um, we want to make sure that the state certainly keeps up their payments to us on a timely fashion and that the distributive formula, the amount that they give to us in lieu of us doing income tax, stays the same, doesn't get cut. Um, we're um, certainly lobbying for pension reform. And, you know, there's another, you know, few things that um, have to do with taxing, you know, they, they're talking about um, changing um, how taxes are charged based on whether you do business, you know, do you charge it where your, your facility is or if you're doing it over the internet. So um, we're lobbying for any of those changes that come. Don't take revenue away from the municipalities, you know, where these, these businesses are. So that's part of it. 
Um, a lot of the outreach we do to local legislators, which has been really pretty effective, has been looking for grants and special programs of any kind that the state or um, the federal government has that we can avail ourselves of to make things uh, a little bit easier financially. And we've been pretty, pretty um, good. We've been pretty fortunate to get a number of grants over the last few years. Uh, Susan Garrett was tremendously helpful getting us um, super, super low loans for doing the wastewater reclamation facility. And we were able to find some things for um, um, environmental uses. We're going to get some grants to do uh, Deerfield Road, you know, to move the sidewalk, that same way. Mm -hmm. So we're lobbying specifically for resources for us and also, you know, in support of all the communities around to make sure that whatever the legislative environment is doesn't become unbeneficial, hurtful. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Uh, Northwest Quadrant. Yeah. Since you brought up landscaping, probably one of the ugliest areas right downtown. Yep. And I know I've heard, you know, their meeting and I've heard some very interesting ideas that just you shake your head and go, I can't believe they're actually saying that. Um, what do you think? What it's called brainstorming. Just, just brainstorming. <laughs> I know, but that AT and T building, having dealt with AT and T around the country, you can't move that. There's nothing yeah. you can do with it. Yeah. Unless you're going to pay twenty million dollars to yeah. move all this stuff. Which so we're not. it's there. You're stuck with it. So just what are what are some ideas that you have? I'm serving on, um, and I'm excited about this. We're, we've put together this Northwest Quadrant Task Force, mm -hmm. and Tom Jester and I um, represent the village. The really cool thing about this, and the new thing about this, is that this is comprised of representatives from all of the interested parties. The reason nothing's been done about the Northwest Quadrant all these years is that it's sort of grown, you know, everybody does their thing, and we're all contiguous to one another, but there hasn't been any sort of comprehensive look at it. And it's the village, and it's the park district, and it's uh, the library, and it's the Presbyterian Church, and it's the business owners, and it's AT&T, and um, actually the train station's included in all of this too, so it's Metro too. So there are people representing all these groups who actually have come to all the meetings. All of the representatives attend all the meetings. That's a big deal. It shows that people are committed and they're interested in this. And at this point, we think there's a hope that we can put together a master plan for this whole area that makes sense. And um, the directive for this was that we're ignoring boundaries. We're ignoring property lines so that we need to get some kind of pedestrian, safe pedestrian access from the southern part from the park district building up to the library so the children are not skittering through the traffic. The library would get a path to them. Maybe it's on park district property, maybe it's on village property, maybe it meanders from one to the other. But to look at it as a whole and ignore those kinds of sort of um, turf, you should pardon the expression, wars, and um, try to figure out how to do this in a way, you know, I'm sure there's going to be some, some horse trading at some point when it, it's time to actually construct this thing, whatever it is that we agree on. But what's exciting is that people have committed to this, people who wouldn't speak to each other before, and people who said, you know, this is what I need, and it's absolutely the opposite of what you need, and I, you can't have it. So um, something's got to get done. I totally agree with you. I mean, in, right in the middle of downtown, everything else has been developed beautifully, and we have the sea of really unattractive asphalt. <laughs> And it doesn't work functionally either. There's safety issues, there's access issues, and then there's the aesthetic issue. Clearly, um, there's you know financial implications. We have to figure out a way we can afford this. Hmm. But um, 
for a lot of years, there was hope that there could be commercial development on this particular piece of property. And that was part of the warfare, too, that, you know, they kept trying and they would put out these RFPs and, you know. I think the acknowledgement has finally been made that that particular property where the parking lot is, the old Lindemann's lot, is not going to be developed commercially. And that we can look at that to do something else appropriate with it. So I'm hopeful. I'm, ho I'm an optimist. I'm hopeful that something's going to get done. But the exciting part is, once again, and I think this is one of the directions I see the village going in, there really is this cooperation between the various bodies who are um, affected by this. And I see this as very positive because um, I have not seen this in the past. So. Um, Mary, one item you mentioned was um, doing more with less and looking for ways to streamline and that sort of thing. And it kind of falls, to me, it kind of um, reminds me of when I'm of working this amount of years in private enterprise, mm -hmm. this was this was kind of a no-brainer. It seems to escape government. So I'm not, but I think vill the village is doing a superb job. Don't get me wrong, but uh, business process for engineering has been around for I don't know 40 or 50 years. It's a very structured approach to looking at overlap, waste, you know, rework, all of the stuff that that adds time and cost to every handoff, unnecessary handoff, or whatever. I'm just really shocked that governments, I'm not saying the village hasn't done this, I'm just saying. I'm uh, just wondering what structured approaches may I, have been discussed. I totally agree. I totally agree that um, it's maddening. And sometimes the speed with which things <laughs> progress for government, it's, it's glacial. <laughs> but, um, Part of the problem is, I think, there really are legal restrictions on how um, taxing bodies have to operate and some government entities. So you are um, bound by, you know, certain sure. bidding processes and, and those sorts of things. So that's, that's part of it. Um, we, uh, at least on the board level, and I know we've communicated this to the staff, and we're seeing evidence of this. Mm -hmm. um, recognize that anytime you can lap projects together to get some kind of economy of scale, anytime you can schedule things so that um, your bidding is more um, advantageous to you, that's what you do. Is there a formal process that they use that that's kind of mode? I'm, I'm not aware of it. Um, you know, Tom Jester, who's on our board, who's a, a, an engineer, he certainly has been making suggestions for that sort of thing. And, and the rest of us, too. That's why it's so hopeful, to me at least, that um, we are working a little bit more closely, particularly with the Park District, that we're having a better relationship and sharing actual projects. You know, when we did, uh, they did Briarwood Park, and we did the pumping station. We developed it together. Mm -hmm. I've, you know, that should be a no-brainer, but it's not stuff that has been happening that so much in the past. You're saying that we're, that the fragmentation in the taxing authorities is, is we're bound by some so, well, set of ordinances that we can't change? In terms of how the fact that the, the village is, is separate yeah, from the park district a, and the... mosquito abatement board and a taxing authority for a, a pension fund and another taxing authority for some is the it, property tax bill is how many I know 15 or 20 taxing authorities yeah crazy. some of it is by state statute but you're on you're a member of a lobbying group too. well <laughs> and you know absolutely this is a this is a, a topic that comes up and we do discuss it um, you know and I certainly brought it up to some of our legislators because um, first of all it's confusing. Secondly, there is an economic impact to it. I mean, there's, there's administrative costs that you could save if some of this stuff was doubled up. But I think it's a larger question than, you yes, know, we can just deal with at the village level. But I think the, level. the anxiety and the stress that you mentioned is coming from is that as we, you know, we're, as a country, we're spending like 26 percent of GDP, and we just voted in a government that wants to take us to 45 percent. And there's very little transparency. I mean, meaningful transparency. 
And I totally understand that, but if you're a volunteer who is doing their best mm -hmm. to help sure. work with an entity that actually only is about 3% of your tax bill. Which drives me crazy too because you guys have a $56 million budget, right? And, and it's the, a very small percentage of your tax bill. Minus how much? It's, it's substantially more. It's substantially more. But to be, you know, all painted with that same brush oh, is somewhat frustrating. <laughs> I, I'm not suggesting. No, that. no, I, I, I know you. I, t I get but, your point. So but I if you were looking for citizen input on where the absolutely. source of frustration and anxiety comes from relative to government, right. then maybe maybe our government should be uh, paid positions as opposed to volunteers. Then you have some, you know, additional motivation of. Um, well, you know. Um, um, consolidating of school districts is something that was done years ago and some communities have decided to consolidate um, typically that's done because of financial necessity hardship or because they're forced to by some larger body those kind of efforts aren't happening I don't see Riverwoods and Bannockburn wanting to just jump on board and be part of Deerfield at this point. Um, I would welcome them if they wanted to come, but there's really no uh, mechanism, you know, no structure uh, set up at this point to do that. I don't know that that, that um, uh, sentiment is out there, and of course self-preservation is certainly a very, very strong human motivation. So, but I, I do, I think you're making a very good point. So are we we're facing some time oh, constraints right now, so we're going to wrap it up uh, for the evening. And you all wanted to thank you very much for coming in. And oh, thank you for having me. And thank for me as much. well. Thank you. And for me as well. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much.